Hey, Rod here at A Better Way to Farm, where we improve yields and increase profits, guys. Welcome to day four. Today, we're going to talk about magnesium uh, because right after potassium because they're very closely related. All of these nutrients are interrelated. A one nutrient cure doesn't exist, and I have a great line from a book here that's one of my favorites I'm going to give you as an example. But today's day four, we're going to talk about magnesium. Let's talk first about what does it do. It is a key element in chlorophyll production. It improves the utilization and the mobility of phosphorus. We need that phosphorus to move from the old growth to the new growth. It is an activator of many plant enzymes. It is directly related to grass tetany, as we well know. It can increase the iron utilization in plants. And guys, it can influence the earliness and the uniformity of your maturity. And some of you are sitting there going, man, we got this because we've got really high K levels. That's not necessarily true. We're going to dive in here and, and work on this and see how that might not be totally accurate. The first thing I want to share with you is some... Uh, some lines out of almost scripture, if you will, out of the, the anatomy of life and energy in agriculture, because this particular two pages here, I'm not going to read them all, but some excerpts, because it's really important to embrace these and then wrap our brain around everything else that we're saying and everything else that we're doing. There are several ag practices that seem to look good, especially to someone with tunnel vision. One of these practices is what's best termed as a single nutrient fix. There are many publications with beautiful photographs of various plants with various nutrient deficiencies. Ponder for a moment. Nature is much more complex than this. Deficiency symptoms are the result of a chain reaction of events that the current system does not take into account. And here's the money line. If you have a rust spot on your car that has come through from the underneath, does it correct the problem to say there is a paint deficiency? If we just spray paint over the top, did we fix it? Not even close. You guys who live where we use a lot of road salt know that often the paint can mask that growing problem, but it does not correct it. And herein lies the major flaw of the single nutrient fix philosophy quality. When that nutrient is added to the crop, did the health and the quality or the mineral content improve as well, or did we just mask the problem? Remember the rule, nutrients must be accompanied by phosphate to be properly assimilated by the plant. If there is a phosphate deficiency, there is a deficiency of all other nutrients. We go on and we jump on over here taking a look at this. He spends a lot of time talking about, in relationship to day three, when we were talking about potassium, he says the reason that potash appears to eliminate the, symps the symptom of a potassium shortage is that myriad of potash or potassium chloride will convert to potassium nitrate, which will then move into the plant. Potassium nitrate carries a great deal of water containing carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide temporarily supplies enough carbon to partially correct the symptoms. The potassium chloride also creates a localized pH change in which more moly is available because the limited amount of phosphate will grab onto that because it has the least resistance to movement. Also, the pH here shows more correction because the nitrate nitrogen carried in with that potash corrects the rest of the symptoms. Guys, it's important to understand that we can hide one nutrient. And oftentimes that, that nutrient deficiency that we're seeing is actually a nutrient deficiency of something else. He talks about that magnesium deficiencies are oftentimes whitey strips along the veins. And sometimes they'll be purple on the bottom side of the leaf. This is a magnesium deficiency. Technically, what it really is, is a nitrogen toxicity. And magnesium is the antidote by pulling out the nitrogen by forming magnesium nitrate that is then flushed out of the plant. Symptoms may appear, excuse me, symptoms may disappear after that single nutrient fix, yet the cause behind them usually remains. 
too much nitrogen will induce a mag deficiency oftentimes. And so we know that these things are interrelated and inter interrelated. And we also know that we're going to talk, you know, today's on magnesium. We're going to talk about a lot of other nutrients because they all interact together. So every one of these days, all 12 days, you can expect to learn things about a lot of the different nutrients. I want to start now going into the Western book here. And uh, first, I want to read just a little something out to you. And then I want to talk about what the deficiencies look like again. Because, guys, we need, we need, we need, we need to know these deficiencies. And here's something. These are so interrelated, guys. That calcium, magnesium, and sodium, as we know, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are actually considered secondary micronutrients, or secondary nutrients, secondary nutrients. But calcium, magnesium, and sodium are usually considered in the in light of their effect on the physical conditions of the soil. This is important to understand. Magnesium affects soil structure so much. It also affects the plant. The nutrient is important in the plant, but a, a an abundance or too much, an excess, if you will, has detrimental effects. A deficiency in the soil has detrimental effects. And so what do we want to do? We want to go in here and make sure that we've got these things right. We're going to talk more about these as we do uh, calcium, magnesium in the future. But uh, the ability of irrigated soils to maintain good structure and be permeable to water and good drainage depends on the ratio of these bases. It's very important to know that if... Um, Calcium gets below 15%, we're going to have major nutritional problems. We also know that if the soil is extremely high in magnesium, number one, we're going to have a calcium deficiency in the plants. And number two, we're going to have really tight soil. And so we want to watch that base saturation and we want to watch it in parts per million to impact that soil structure and impact those uh, plants that are growing out there. Magnesium is an essential ingredient, chlorophyll. We've already talked about that. It translocates starch in the plant. It's also pretty, it is considered to be essential for the formation of oils and fats and aids in the translocation and the absorption of phosphorus. Okay, it helps phosphorus to move, but phosphorus carries other nutrients. So therefore, a magnesium deficiency in a plant is going to create an, an artificial deficiency in a lot of other nutrients. Symptoms, this is what we want to grab. Leaves lose their color at the tips and between the veins, starting with the lower leaves and working their way upward. It depends on the degree of deficiency as to how much it shows. Leaves can be abnormally thin. Leaves can be brittle. They can have a tendency to curve upward. Guys, we need to know these deficiencies. You guys know that I am a firm believer in knowing these because when we see yellow, we tend to think nitrogen, and that's not the case. Part of this has to do with does the, does the nutrient translocate well in the plant. Magnesium will move into the new growth pretty easily, leaving behind old growth that is deficient. If we go into the field, we're going to do this several times. I really want you to internalize it. If we go into the field and our plant has yellow leaves at the top, no striping, just yellow leaves, that highly likely that is sulfur. If we have just at the bottom, we have yellowing of the leaves. It's in a V, and it's working its way down the leaf. That's probably nitrogen. If we are at the top of the plant, and we have yellow intervenal striping, that's probably manganese, because manganese doesn't move into the new growth very well. And so we have to pay attention to make sure it's available throughout the growing season. If we are at the bottom of the plant, and we have intervenal striping, that's probably magnesium. And guys, this can cost you a lot of yield. We've seen, we've known for some time there was some relationships between mag and K in particular. We're going to get into those here in a little bit. But we want to make sure that we under, understand that magnesium is important for soil structure and the plant. All of your secondaries are the same way. Calcium, magnesium, sulfur all have to do with soil structure. We know, guys, that that base saturation is critical. We have to pay attention to that. we got to know what is our base saturation of K, what is our base saturation of calcium, what is our base saturation of mag, and what do those need to look like. But then, 
especially in regards to potassium and magnesium, we need to know the relationship in parts per million. Why is that? Well, we figured out some time ago, we'd been studying it and thought we had it, and then we got a chance to dial it in and really confirm it, and we've done that several times since then, but we figured out that magnesium and potassium have a unique relationship in that one of them can overwhelm the other, or you can reverse it and the other can overwhelm the first. I'll give you an example. You're out here in your farm, you've got high mag levels, you've got 300 parts per million mag, and you think, man, we are really high, that's excessive, we have really got a lot of magnesium, therefore this maturity thing should be nailed, we got this. But then we get to looking at your soil test and we realize you have 300 parts per million mag, but you have 500 or 600 parts per million potassium, and now all of a sudden, what have we done? We have induced a mag deficiency. Why? Because potassium and magnesium compete on the to, to be absorbed into the plant, and the high one, the top one, the one with the most warriors, if you will, will overwhelm the other one. And once we get to that, I get nervous when it gets to one-to-one. -one. Uh, some of the books say three-to-one. We know that we get a response to mag anytime we're getting a 1.5K to a mag. In other words, if we have mag at 300 and we have... Uh, potassium at 450, there's no question we're going to get a response. And once they're even, I tend to do that. So how should it be? It should be the other way. We should have about one part potassium for each two to two and a half parts magnesium. So if we had a couple hundred parts potassium in our soil parts per million, what should we have? We ought to have somewhere around 500, 600 uh, parts per million mag. And that can get out of whack too. Here on our farm, you go right across the road, we battle this because we were, God give us high mag soils and then he gave us a quarry that's really close that sells high mag lime. And so consequently, every time we needed to lime, I didn't, but the people before me would just go get the closest, cheapest lime and it would raise the pH. Why is that? Well, mag actually raises pH faster than calcium that doesn't mean that it's a good thing. So the last few years, we've been hauling lime in here from 45 miles away because that's where we have to go to get a high calcium, very low mag lime. And we're starting to drive a little bit of that mag off and get that level to drop. And the crazy part is we're really not changing our pH much. That's kind of a zero sum game. As I put on more calcium, I see mag go down, but I see pH remain constant. And so we're trying to work through that and make it work out the way that it's supposed to. But guys, that relationship between K and mag is really, really important. Um, as I look at the fertilizer handbook here and we go to page 95 and they talk about the, um, the magnesium, because magnesium is a part of the chlorophyll deficiency symptoms often appears yellowing between the veins of your older leaves. This is more likely to happen on acid soils under high rainfall. However, some mag deficiencies are reported on high on soils high in calcium and potassium due to their, their competitive effect on these elements. So guys, it has a lot to do. Can we be mag deficient from having not enough? Absolutely. We can also be mag deficient from having too much. We're going to talk about that here in a minute too. As we go into um, Schrieffer's book here, and we start looking at what he has to say about this from the soil up. It's very interesting to see how these guys have studied it, and so many of them have come up with basically the exact same thing, the same thoughts, the same findings. Soil mag levels must be checked in making potassium recommendations. High potash applications on soils that are marginal in magnesium can cause a magnesium deficiency in the crop. We know that, we just keep talking about it because it's really important guys to understand that and implement this. So when we start looking at limestone, in particular I'm gonna talk about dolomatic limestone, high cal or calcitic limestone basically is all calcium. Dolomitic limestone has calcium, but it also has magnesium in it. So pure calcium carbonate will be about 40% calcium and pure magnesium carbonate contains about 
magnesium. Limestones are often rated with their neutralizing powers, and a magnesium carbonate will neutralize more acid than an equal amount of calcium carbonate. So dolomatic limestone will always have a higher neutralizing rating than the calcium carbonate. What does that mean? It means if the only thing you're looking at is your pH, then that is going to make it jump up faster. That's gonna make it become a better pH for you if you're trying to get it up to a, a six, eight, six, nine level. However, it, because it works fast, doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. If your mag levels are more than two and a half times your K, it's not the right thing. If your base saturation on mag is more than 18%, it's definitely the wrong thing. We would prefer that base saturation be somewhere between 12 and 15. And so it makes a difference as to what kind of lime we use. Guys, everything we do impacts everything else. And it's just really important to understand that we want to make sure and use the right product at the right time, at the right place, from the right source. And high mag lime may not be the right source. As we don't get into hands-on agronomy here, and I'm going to start out, there's a lot of stuff out of this I want to share. And we've dug through these books and dug through these books to find that part which is important and try to make, they're all important, don't get me wrong, but to bring out the parts that will impact you the most and have the most financial um, effect on your farm. Something to be aware of. 150 bushel corn crop takes about 28 pounds of calcium and 28 pounds of magnesium. Therefore, we want to be very careful to make sure that we're not having either one of those be too low. We have to make sure that we're keeping both the nutrients out there available because they're going to, to need those as we try to grow that corn crop that we're so adamant about getting. An excess of magnesium as well as nitrogen in the soil initiates the process which will prevent the crop from growing dry and nutritionally ripe, which is a, the major goal of every farmer. Hear me well. Too much mag and or, and or too much nitrogen initiates a process that will prevent the crop from getting mature. Now, not enough magnesium will also prevent the crop from getting mature. Clay soils, high in mag and low in calcium, cement together. They are subject to compaction and clotting. They crust over very easily, and that prevents the soaking in of water, and it prevents the recovery of the capillary water during the dry seasons. Guys, when we have too much mag, we really hurt our ability to neutralize, or excuse me, we hurt our ability to utilize the water that we get. And so we, that's why it's so important to pay attention to this. You say, well, what do I do? I got ultra high magnesium. What am I going to do? How am I going to drive it out? It's going to take time. It's not going to be, and you're, you may never get it down to where you want it, but A, you can farm around it. How do I farm around it? Well, number one, I make sure when I'm putting on limestone, I'm putting on calcitic lime. No mag, high calcium lime. And keep trying to drive that off the soil colloid. Sometimes a higher dose of sulfur will be your friend to help out. If you'll use a potassium sulfate, hopefully that will help to drive that off. Even better than that would be ammonium thiosulfate or ammonium sulfate. In particular, if you have a high mag and a high pH, ammonium sulfate, the dry broadcast 210024 is your friend. And I would encourage you guys watching this. You're not going to buy any of this from me. I would encourage you. You got high pH and high mag. I would definitely spin on 100 pounds of ammonium sulfate on half your field. See what it does. See how it helps you out and what you can expect to get out of that. I love the work that these guys have done, and none of this is new. We're seeing new work come in that is, is confirming this. We ourselves have done a lot of plots and and done those things. Here was something that I never caught before this year. This is something that is new and it's kind of scary when I think about the ramifications and it's this. High magnesium, <coughs> excuse me, high magnesium and low calcium permits organic residue to decay into alcohol and that alcohol becomes a sterilant to the bacteria in your soil. So when we have really high mag and inadequate calcium, 
as that organic residue decays, it, it turns into an alcohol. And what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to have it in there and it's going to hurt the life in our soil, which is the last thing that we want to do. We want to have that soil just as healthy as we can. All of the bugs growing that we can find. I had an interesting conversation this week with a doctor. I was, it was a lot of fun to get to know a couple that don't live very far from me and to, and to take a look at some of the things, but talking about the life in the soil and talking about putting bugs in the soil, but maybe rather than introduce a bunch of bugs that we don't know what the long-term ramifications are or even the short-term benefits, maybe what we ought to do is take a look at the things that, that make us grow bacteria better. For instance, we know boron grows mycorrhiza. And I think in the next 20 years, you guys have heard me say, we're going to figure out that all of the nutrients are important for the crop, but they're also important for soil structure. And they're also important for feeding different bacteria, some of which we probably haven't named yet that haven't been identified. Calcium and magnesium go hand in hand. Magnesium is a constituent of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll and photosynthesis rely on its presence and availability. Magnesium also aids in phosphate metabolism, as well as activating the enzyme systems in the plant. Magnesium in conjunction with calcium is the key to air and water in the soil. Magnesium helps hold the soil together and tightens it up. Too much of this wonder element hardens the soil when it's dry. It was interesting because I read somewhere, I didn't write it down and get to the book, but one of these books talked about other uses for magnesium and they talked about concrete and glue. I thought, wow, that, that's kind of interesting. That's not what we want to do uh, with our soils. We do not want to turn them into concrete. We do not want them to glue together. We need some, but we don't want too much. Again, magnesium causes stripes in, the ve in between the veins and often a purplish color on the lower side. Yes, I've said that several times. Why? Because I want you to be able to diagnose it when you see it. When you go, ooh, that's not sulfur. Ooh, that's not nitrogen. That's magnesium. I need to get a couple of pints of a chelated magnesium and fix this situation that I have. And I can do it relatively easily and relatively inexpensively. This was an interesting line. Too much magnesium in a soil prevents the plant from getting enough magnesium. Too much mag will keep that plant from doing it. I know that here. When I was a kid in high school, we lost a cow. We had her posted. She looked very healthy. Couldn't figure out why. We'd went out to grass. It was late April, but it had been a cool, wet spring. Vet came and he said she died of grass tetany, which is a magnesium deficiency. And so we put out high mag blocks and didn't lose any more cows. Our mag levels are through the roof here. But what happens when it's cool and it's damp out, the mag making the soil so tight actually makes the mag unavailable. And so in the spring, when we go to grass, we have to feed high mag blocks if we're going to go very early. And so we want to make sure that we're taking care of that. But again, the fact that you have high mag does not mean you have even adequate mag in your crops. That's why the tissue testing is so important. You can take those tissue tests and determine if there's a hidden hunger and determine if you need to apply some more magnesium in order to get the yield response that you want. Again, talking about nitrogen overuse. Okay, guys, I think I used this on day one, but I'm going to hit it again because it's really important. Nitrogen drives out calcium. When the soil is open and nitrates leach out and go with the water, it is never a solo journey. It always takes a passenger every single time. If there is a cache of sodium, nitrogen may take out sodium. Otherwise, it takes out calcium. Nitrogen never, ever takes out magnesium. But as it leaches downward, you can assure the passenger status of calcium is number one. Removal by 10, of 10% 10 calcium by nitrogen oversupply will increase the mag level by 10%. This is why one of the reasons that anhydrous ammonia has a reputation for tightening soils. It drives out the calcium, which raises the base saturation of mag, and therefore it becomes much tighter. There's a Midwest theory that potassium gets around in water and gets trapped in the colloids. It can't get loose until something is done to change the chemistry. 
in that form in its form it is unavailable because the soil colloid has trapped it perhaps that is why whenever magnesium gets higher and higher and the soil gets tighter and tighter potassium availability gets lower and lower this is a vicious cycle as we put on too much potassium chloride we tighten down the soil we tighten down the soil calcium is more prone to leave than magnesium and all of a sudden if we can bring that level down the soil will loosen up and what happens we have more available potassium that is in between those soil particles that can get moved out. So getting the potassium out of the plant is dependent upon getting the magnesium out of the soil. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I went a little longer here today than I intended to, but this is one of the things that I'm just really excited about. I wanna talk again, I wanna contrast the idea of, of magnesium and manganese and uh, Magne manganese is not to be confused with magnesium. It helps crops do things like germinate. It does hasten fruiting and ripening. It helps with the assimilation of nitrates. It helps with the assimilation of carbon dioxide. In combination with potassium and copper, it provides stock strength, so it's a plant health deal. But we compare that to magnesium. And even though the deficiencies are somewhat similar, both, time, both times the plants turn yellow or white intervenally. However, the difference, manganese is at the top, magnesium is at the bottom, so that's our deficiency. Guys, I appreciate your time and tuning in, and I, you know, I hope you find value in what we do. I hope you find us over on our podcast platform. Type in A Better Way to Farm wherever you have a podcast platform. Um, go to Facebook if you're not watching us there already, A Better Way to Farm. Go to TikTok, A Better Way to Farm. Go to betterwaytofarm.com and take the profit calculator and see what you can grab for ideas for 2024. We just finished a fantastic two-day Fundamentals of Agronomy in Bettendorf, Iowa. Guys, I have so many happy people. So many people going, wow, we've been looking for this. We couldn't find it. I want to encourage you to reach out. Don't be shy. You know, I got people, oh, I followed you for three years. I didn't want to bother you. Bother us. Call us, 641-919-1206. Send a text. Send us a message on Facebook. Somehow, get back to us and let us see what we can do to help you. That's why we do what we do in order to make a difference. I appreciate all of your time, guys. I hope you're having a, a good holiday. I hope you found your Christmas shirts. I love Christmas. I love Christmas sweaters. I like lights a whole bunch. That's why there's lights on the pickup. So, guys, I hope that everything is going well for you, and we really do hope you're having a better day.